There we go, and we are live. Hello, and welcome everyone to Circuit Streams Building a VR Bowling Experience Workshop. Today, we're going to be learning how to create a basic mini bowling game for VR. Uh, I'm your host, Brandon, and shortly we'll be joined by your instructor for today, Usman or Ozzy Murr. Uh, just before we get into it, um, actually, I'm jumping ahead of myself there even. Before we get into it, I want to do a quick audio video check. Um, just let me know in the comments if you can hear me, if you can see me, it would be greatly appreciated. Diana, Rexy, hello, Ryan. Regina, awesome. Hello, everyone. Good. Perfect. Uh, sounds like I'm getting a good response, so much appreciated. Um, also wanted to provide a quick overview of your layout here. Um, to the top right of your interactions tab, I'll call it, uh, you'll notice a little bit of a bell icon there. If any of the sounds or notifications are distracting to you or annoying to you, go ahead and hit that bell icon and it will silence all of them. Um, with regards to comments, feel free to, to chat with other audience members. Uh, I know we have a few team members in the audience as well who would love to hear. There we go. Seems like somebody is trying to take over my hosting right now. Um, in any case, we are back. I think we're good to go. There'll be a video available later. Yes, Davis, there absolutely will be. Uh, this session will be recorded and sent to all registrants. Uh, and we also had our project materials sent out earlier today. So um, if you didn't receive those, just let uh, Z in the audience know and she will send you another copy. Uh, but yes, there will be a, uh, a recording of this uh, made available to you later as well. Um, just with regards to uh, your layout here, again, there is a questions tab as well. So if you do have questions more technical in nature, uh, definitely um, post them there under the questions tab. We are going to be doing a QA and a at the end of this workshop, and we want to make sure that we are well organized and that we can you know, address any questions you have throughout. Uh, lastly, we also have a polls tab, and I'm just going to bring that up as well. Um, changes you made, oh no. Okay, so I am just gonna test out this polls tab. We have, uh, we, we will have, you know, a couple of polls throughout um, and it's looking like it's not working right now. The problem with my connection. My goodness. Okay, it seems somebody is trying to uh, to pirate my hosting ability. So I do uh, I do apologize for the uh, the disturbances here. Uh, we will get into the uh, the technical session shortly. I just wanted to ask one question, one of these questions for the polls, uh, and that is how much experience do you have using um, publish poll using Unity? So on a scale of zero to ten, are you guys experts? Uh, are you new? Uh, are you familiar with Unity? Uh, go ahead and check out that polls tab. We would love to know your kind of experience level at this stage. Uh, and again, I apologize for the disturbances. Um, so yeah, Kelly, go ahead and check out that polls tab. I just posted it, and uh, and that's going to help us kind of, uh, I guess, quantify where everyone is at with regards to Unity. Um, just quickly, I wanted to uh, to introduce myself. My name is Brendan. I am on the education team here at Circuit Stream. Um, I come from a background of investment and uh, and finance, and uh, just saw where this this kind of technology was going, and wanted to uh, to definitely get involved. Uh, Circuit Stream, obviously, being a fantastic place to do that. Uh, fun fact: I'm a competitive rugby player who has never ever broken a bone. Um, I like that stat. I feel like it's rare, um, but that's my fun little fact. 
Uh, I'm also hosting from Toronto, Canada. Uh, feel free to post in the comments section where you're joining us from. I would love to know where our reach is today. Uh, whereabouts in the world are you? Ozzy's got 15 years. Wow, not too shabby, Ozzy. Kelowna, London, North Carolina, Exton, Rome, holy smoke, Sweden. Oh my goodness, we're all over the world today. I love it, awesome. Thank you for sharing, guys. Um, a little bit about your host. So uh, Usman, or Ozzy Murr, as we like to call him, uh, he's a lead instructor and XR developer here at CircuitStream. Uh, like he mentioned in the, uh, the comments there, he's got over 15 years of experience with Unity, uh, seven plus of that uh, being related to XR development. Uh, his fun fact is that he's passionate about jazz and he plays the drums. And I know for a fact he's also uh, got a couple of side projects on the go. Uh, so you're learning from a great instructor today. He, uh, he does this stuff for fun. Uh, which is you know, great. Uh, just a little overview about uh, our agenda today. Um, so wanted to do a, just a bit more of an introduction uh, about CircuitStream. Shouldn't take more than you know, 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, then we'll move on to the technical session where we will be building a bowling VR game. Uh, should take about 45 to 60 minutes, sometimes more. Um, after that, we'll wrap up and I'll share a little bit more uh, resources as well as information about CircuitStream and, and the courses that we offer. Uh, for no more than 10 minutes, and then uh, and then we'll get to our live Q&A at the end. Uh, so yeah, save all your questions, put them in the questions tab. It's going to help us keep tabs on those questions and, and make sure we get answer them all. Uh, just as a reminder, the recording uh, of this session will be sent out afterwards, uh, and you should have already received the, the uh, project materials. If you didn't, reach out to one of our team members in the audience, uh, and they'll be able to help you out with that. So a little bit about CircuitStream. So we were formed in 2015 when we identified a demand for education in the growing XR industry. Uh, our focus is on providing the highest quality education in XR design and development, as well as for industry leading tools such as Unity. Uh, to date, we've helped over 40,000 learners develop their technical skills around emerging tech. We also have team members and instructors all over the world uh, who are passionate about accelerating the AR, VR, uh, and technical industries. Uh, this also helps us accommodate students across different time zones and geographies. And it looks like we have you know, many of you joining us today, which is great to see. So CircuitStream is a Unity channel and uh, an authorized training partner. Um, our Unity certified instructors have a combined decades of experience in Unity as well as XR development. Now, some of the organizations we've worked with include Walmart, Lockheed Martin, the U.S. Navy, uh, many big recognizable names. Uh, but we also work with, you know, large, small companies right down to the individual learner. CircuitStream offers uh, flagship courses around programming, XR development and design, as well as for you know, Unity's very robust development or physics engine. Uh, these academic offerings include uh, our XR Development with Unity course. Uh, this is a 10 week in duration course consisting of three hours of live session, uh, live sessions each week. Um, it is beginner friendly uh, for any students or professionals who are interested in adding the fundamentals of XR development to their skill sets. Uh, the next cohort will actually be, getting, uh, be starting on May 17th. Uh, we also have XR interaction design and prototyping. Um, again, 10 weeks, beginner friendly, and has three hours of uh, of live session per week. Um, and this is for artists and designers who are wanting to focus on immersion, environmental elements, and user experience. Uh, so students will learn the process of prototyping for AR and VR, and it is a very popular program among UI, UX designers, as well as product designers. Um, so either of these XR focus courses are project driven and have been designed to help students break into exciting professions uh, related to augmented virtual or mixed reality uh, and then we also have partnered with a number of post-secondary institutions to grant further access to this kind of education, uh, which I'll share more about uh, just towards the end there. Uh, now that third one, Unity Developer Bootcamp, that is our newest and uh, most extensive course yet. It revolves around launching your career as a real-time 3D developer, employing Unity as your main tool for creation. The 24-week career course offers more than five hours of live instruction throughout the week with an additional five hours of hands-on learning in workshops over the weekends. Uh, you'll learn how to code in C Sharp, manage a multitude of programs and resources integrated with Unity, uh, as well as professionally manage Unity projects. 
There will also be a multitude of resources and career services students can access to help launch their career in real-time 3D development. The next cohort for, uh, for the Unity Developer Bootcamp will be on April 11th. Now we also have one-on-one -on -one support and mentorship packages uh, where you can leverage the expertise of one of our instructors, um, anything related to Unity, XR, uh, or development, even with things like uh, Unreal Engine. Um, so these sessions have tons of flexibility regarding how you use this. Uh, this time, it can be leveraged for additional course learning, uh, for troubleshooting and project support, or for learning about topics within XR that may not be captured you know, in our flagship course curriculum. But what are, we, what are we wondering about today? What are we learning more about? Uh, well, you're gonna learn how Unity is used to build virtual reality games and apps, uh, how to set up a project in Unity, how to throw objects in VR, how to implement and manipulate physics in VR, and how to create basic interactions in VR. Um, so before uh, Ozzy jumps on the stage here, I just wanna, wanna have a few reminders. Um, so this next part will take, um, in and around 60 minutes, sometimes more, sometimes less. Um, everything's gonna be recorded and sent to you afterwards. Um, and if you haven't received the project files, ask one of our teammates in, in the, uh, the lobby about it. Um, questions should be directed to the questions tab for the Q&A at the end. Uh, and other than that, sit back, relax, and soak up all this great information that Ozzy is about to share with you. Uh, so without further ado, let's start it. Let's, let's get building a VR bowling game. Uh, Ozzy, are you with us? Uh oh, can we hear you? Is it just me? Oh boy. Oh no. I love that sticker you got on your uh, your headset there. Always uh, always packs a punch. You can call him Ozzy today, or you can call him the kingpin of Circuit Stream. Um, either either one works and uh, makes a lot of sense. It's live, so no problem. We're gonna have to edit this out of the out of the uh, the recording, I think. As long as, as well as a few other uh, technical difficulties. Ah, <laughs> oh, we did the sound test and it worked perfectly like 10 minutes ago. Oh, that? can you hear me? Oh, there it is. There we go. Sorry about that. It, uh, I think it changed my uh, mic uh, option, so it, it shows something else on me. Gotcha. But, yeah, that, that's, I, that's what. That's what I, I will. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, now that now that we can hear your beautiful voice, I will jump off stage here and uh, and yeah, enjoy. All right. Thank you. Well, uh, welcome everyone to the technical portion of the uh, VR bowling workshop application. Now, what we'll be doing today is creating a nice, simple bowling app using the XR Interaction Toolkit. Now, there are many options for setting up a uh, VR application, such as XR Plugin Management and so forth, but we're going to use uh, the Interaction Toolkit. It's becoming more of that industry standard. And uh, let's dive in. I'll just share my screen. I'll let you all see that there. making sure that this is up and running we'll go from there i think my left controller just died on me so use my right here there we go so this is the experience i'll just make my game window a little bit bigger for you all as well so you can see that a little bit easier so i'm looking right now at the unity interface the right side here is going to be my view the left side here is what the developer sees when they're working in uh, the software Unity. So I'll go ahead and hit play and we'll try that out. So I'm the user here, right side. You can see I'm looking around. I can point and hold the grip button 
and grab this nice little bowling ball. Bear with me, I'm not the best at this part. So I'll, I'll try though. I don't have enough space to do an underhand roll, but uh, hopefully that uh, becomes a little bit visible as I move towards it. And did I get, oh, there we go. I hit a couple of them. Oh, wow, actually I did really good that time. That's pretty good, almost all the pins. Okay, but anyways, yeah, that, that never happens, but uh, <laughs> work for the demo. So th this is kind of what we're gonna be working on. And once the ball uh, hits the end there, it goes off the end, another bowling ball will appear right here for us to pick up and bowl again. But based on the amount of time we have, we can definitely increase uh, some function, add some more functionality to it beyond that, but that's that's the goal here. Now we have just the need silly bully alley animations on TV. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So let's take a look step by step how we achieve such an effect. Now there is a sample scene already for your project. So if you import this project, you'll see that under the bowling assets folder and the B-Rock scene here, it's pretty empty, allowing you to follow along without loading anything. So if you want to follow along, you have this project file, definitely go ahead, go into your assets folder, models, bowling assets, and load up this particular scene file. I'm gonna start from scratch so you can see all of the things, but uh, that's the idea. So how do we make an XR capable application from scratch? I'm just gonna close that there. And I'm gonna open up Unity Hub there. One of my connections getting a job at EA Vancouver. So that's cool. Uh, but anyways, Unity Hub. This is the first program you'll see after you've downloaded Unity. We'll see if I go to my installs section here, you can find all the installation version, all the installed versions on my computer. Now, for those of you who are looking to develop for the Oculus Quest, just one extra step you might need to take. You might have already done it, which is great. But uh, under installs, we would go up to the top right here for, for this demo, we're just using Unity 2020.3. Click on the three vertical dots, add modules. And we wanna make sure that we have Android build support if we're developing for the Oculus Quest. The Oculus Quest uses an Android processor, but you don't need to do that right now. I would leave it aside because that'll prevent you from opening up Unity. But uh, you'd select it, you click done, but you can do that later. I'm going to use Oculus Link, which allows me to test my uh, VR application by hooking up my Quest to my PC, which happens to have a VR capable graphics card. Anyways, let's take a look here. So we'd have Unity Hub open this program. We'd go to new and it'll default to the newest version I have. And uh, we got a few options for the versions that we want to uh, select. Now, some of you may have different naming for them, but the key thing there is to recognize that URP or Universal Render Pipeline is the one that we want to create the project with. Now, again, if you've downloaded the project, you don't have to go through the step, but in case you want to recreate different XR projects, you can do so. Now, Universal Render Pipeline, why are we going with that? Well, it's the most performant uh, render pipeline for the Oculus Quest, for example, actually. It's the most performant out of all of them. It may not look as good as the HDRP, which is a great option for PC VR experiences, Nevertheless, we'll go with URP, it just performs really good. So now that I have that selected, I'd rename my project to something like uh, VR Bowling. And my location, I will just go back here. And yeah, that should be good enough. I'll select that folder, got a nice spot there, and I'll go ahead and create that Unity project. So that would be us starting up a project. We chose the appropriate render pipeline that we'd like to use. Um, we, we can ask some more questions about those pipelines after uh, after the work technical portion as we get into the Q&A. Nevertheless, there's my uni new Unity project starting up. Even at this time, if there's any questions, please feel free to ask. Oh, it looks like we got some questions coming in. How long did it take to code the example? 
oh not much at all actually the, there is very little coding done in this project i'll show you what uh what there was it's very very much what version of visual studio i'm using 2019 seems to have the least number of problems with it me too right on the newest version of 2019 is pretty good though it has like machine learning algorithms to make it perform our you know guess what you're trying to do a little bit better how long did the project take not just code oh not long at all maybe well the 3d models i didn't make the 3d models so with that in mind it may have taken under an hour yeah easily sub hour amount of work maybe yeah but, uh, really the longest period was the loading times <laughs> okay so when I have a new Unity project, this is what I would see. Um, what I would want to do if I wasn't using the existing project, which is uh, which is here, the actual bowling workshop, what I would need to do is bring in some of these assets. So I'll just put that aside. And in Unity, it's nice and simple to bring things in. Go to my assets folder here. And from another project, from a file explorer, doesn't matter. And you just nice and easily bring a folder right into another unity project and it will copy over all the assets that i need and i mentioned this because well i want to create uh one of these uh 3d model scenes that's that's the goal here it'll remain here as well it's just a copy okay so i've got the uh, 3d models that i want I, I imported this model folder boom there it is and go into that folder bowling assets and load up that beautiful scene okay and so now we would be on the same page as if you had gotten the project right so nothing uh nothing really set up here there's not even a camera set up uh so i'm just going to quickly explain some of these windows if some of you are unfamiliar with unity altogether uh, if i double check that poll there um let me, let me quickly check this i think i saw a lot of people having zero experience with unity so i just want to explain a little bit for uh for this now, as a side note, although Unity is listed as a game engine, you can do so much more than just making games, as a side note. Can you repeat how to open the bowling scene, please? Sure. So I was under my assets. What I did was I brought over the 3D model. So this models folder, which you already have, so you can go into the models folder, go into bowling assets, and there's this thing called a scene file. You double click on that and it would load this project up. So that's what I would want you to do. But if you're starting a project from scratch, which is gonna bring that models folder into this Unity window folder to, uh, to get this scene up and running. However, the scene has no functionality yet. So we'll, that's what we'll work on now. Okay, so I've got this nice models folder. There's my bowling assets folder within it and BRock bowl file and boom, I'm there. Okay, so what are we looking at here with the Unity interface? So this is Unity at the bottom there. Should we be in Unity as well? Zero experience here. You can uh, sit back, relax, and watch. That's totally fine as well. If you want to try and follow along, I will uh, try to uh, provide sufficient uh, time to do so. But it will be tough in the short amount of time we have. Uh, but yeah, if you're up for it, go ahead. Okay, but anyways, here at the bottom, I have the project window. This displays all of my assets, all of the files in my project. Now, when I say the word assets, I'm talking about scene files, our code, 3D models, music, pictures, images, textures, everything is considered an asset pretty much. I plan to follow along the video afterwards. Perfect, there you go, Ryan. So I've got my assets folder, this is my project window. Now, there's a console tab here. This is when you start coding, you start programming, you'll see your errors, warnings, debug logs, all that will appear here. We won't worry about that too much for now. But there we are. Now, this big window in the middle, well, it might be your scene view or your game window. If it's gear, if it's your game window, you'll probably just see a black screen in the bowling scene. So the scene window, this is where you as the developer can fly around and alter your world. So I can say something like, oh, you know what? I don't, I don't like that helicopter being there, perhaps. So I think the helicopter is kind of part of a bigger thing. And I can just say, you know, okay, I don't like the outside. 
boom, I'm just gonna turn everything else off or move it around some some amount, you know. You can edit a lot of things. Now, this scene is meant to be a little simplified, so everything on the outside is combined together as one mesh. Won't worry too much about that, but that's that's kind of the idea. You can move these things around as the developer. So that's what's going on. Now, this middle one is our lane. We've got our pins set up there to knock down. We'll go over that momentarily as well. Now, that is our scene view, your dev view. Game window is going to be when you hit this play button, this will show what the user should see. That's the idea. Now, on the left side here, this is called a hierarchy window. It lists every game object in our scene, and everything is a game object. This bowling ball is a game object. This, this return, ball return thing is a game object. That light bulb light bulb icon that represents the lighting in the environment is also a game object everything listed here is a game object that's the idea now apart from just listing off the game object it also helps list parent child relationships so for example i select this pin here now this pin it's it's got some components we'll talk about but you can see how it is kind of part of a drop down of the pin set object so this is considered a child. So I can move the pin independently, but if I select the pin set object and move it, well, it's the parent. So it'll move everything, including rotation and scaling, all that stuff. So that's the idea behind parent-child relationships. Their movements, rotations, and scales are associated together like that. Where did you get the bowling assets from? Unity Asset Store? Uh, I believe so. Uh, I'll have to double check. I got it from uh, our shared Slack. So just for the educational purpose here, that's the idea. Now, here we've got uh, our insets going. We got a hierarchy window. And now what's here on the far right side of my screen? This is the inspector window. Now, by default, it might be empty. You might see this readme file here, but... Basically, it will give you all the information about a selected asset or game object. We have a GitHub link to assets, etc., but I think we don't all understand how to bring them into Unity. Fair enough. Uh, when you go to the GitHub itself here, you can go ahead and say code, and you can open this with GitHub, but a lot of you are new to this. So you can download this GitHub repository as a zip file. And once you've got it in your project, in your computer somewhere as a zip file, you can unzip that somewhere and wherever you decide to unzip it. Let's see if I go to my GitHub folder here. So you get that whole project file as a zip file. We unzip it somewhere around here. So let's say my workshops folder, I unzipped it and that's what it looks like. Okay, so there is my project here. I've unzipped this. So what I would do next is go to Unity Hub and I would go click on Add and I would find that project. So VR Bowling, I would click Select Folder and boom, it would be added to my Unity Hub list of projects. And then I can just click on that to open it. So if anyone didn't catch that, let me just repeat that once again. I would go to the GitHub repo here. I would click where it says Code and then I can download a zip file of this project. And then I would unzip it somewhere in my uh, file explorers, you know, right click, unzip, so unzip, unzip. And there would be the actual folder that contains all the project files. I would go to Unity Hub once again. And then I could go to add and find that VR bowling, in this case, project. Your The name might be a little different for you, but then I could select that folder. It would then be added to my list of projects here. I could then click on it and load it up. Now, some of you are saying that your assets look pink. Well, that would be because it's not using the universal render pipeline. So if they're all pink, that's because um, perhaps, let's go to edit project settings. I go to project settings, I go to quality. So edit project settings and under the quality section, you might be missing universal RP, uh, some asset here. 
So that's because I've started this project in URP. If you remember, we did Unity Hub when we started our project. We went new. So I'll click on new. And then I selected the universal render pipeline template or whatever template that's available that says URP or universal render pipeline, something of that nature. But that's the one we wanted to start it. In. So if that's mismatching, that's why it's going to look pink. If you want uh, to make it not look pink, what you would do is if you started it in a standard pipeline, so it's pink, you'd go to window at the top, you go to package manager, you would go to packages unity registry, you would find in this list of packages, universal RP, and you would install that. Once that's installed in your project, this is going to be a little bit of a thing that you'll have to revisit because it could take some time. But um, we went to window, package manager, make sure that we're under the Unity registry in our packages options, scroll on down to universal RP. We would install that. Then in our uh, project folder here, you'd create a settings folder usually. And you can right click here and go to create, rendering, universal render pipeline, pipeline asset forward render. So you would go through this to create a pipeline asset. That's what would allow you to uh, update your render pipeline. So once you've done that, you've got that going, that file is there, right? It's created. You would have two kinds of files, the forward renderer or and the universal RP file. So you'd have these two files. Great. So now to update, go to edit, project settings, quality, and you can drag and drop that second file you get into here. Boom. You've upgraded your render pipeline. And now your project is universal instead of using the standard or legacy render pipeline. Uh, and if you still have some remaining pink material, you can also click on edit, render pipeline, universal render pipeline, and upgrade project materials to universal RP materials. Now, hopefully none of you, uh, not too many of you have to do this. This is something you can watch in the recording as to how to upgrade a Unity project to URP. Okay. Hopefully that'll uh, help you out, Simon, fix that pink issue. Uh, well, it should anyways. Let's uh, let's return to uh, to our project now. So we've, we get some understanding of these uh, assets here, these, some of these windows, but if I select an object, you'll see that in the inspector window, it's basically telling me all the information about that selected object or asset. Here, this object, this bowling ball, has in the inspector window, a little active or inactive state. It has a name, tags and layers, transform component, which gives you the position, rotation, and scale of the object, right? So those kinds of properties are handled there. It has a mesh filter, which defines what kind of mesh it is. In our case, mostly you know, spherical mesh and a mesh renderer that determines what that mesh is going to look like. So what colors and textures are on that mesh, for example. Mesh renders can uh, also have materials that use special shaders to manipulate it, which is outside the scope of this workshop, but maybe in a future workshop, I'll do that. Uh, but anyways, those are some of the components that make up this object. Similar thing, if I select one of the pins here, I will be able to see that it has a transform, position, rotation, scale, mesh filter. So what is the geometry of this object? Mesh renderer, so what texture or color it is, that kind of thing, as well as, as, well as a rigid body. Rigid body is a physics-based component. This is what allows us to add forces to an object. So for example, gravity is what's going to make this object fall down. When I hit play, it will fall down. That's the rigid body, for example, when something crashes into something. How are you able to keep the capsule collider on the pin standing up? Usually when I've worked with that type, it falls. Well, we have a capsule collider. So you can see this green outline kind of thing. This is the collider. This is the physical space it is taking up. Now, I happen to be using a perfectly flat surface and the capsule collider, its rotation is zeroed out. So it is just barely balancing. It has one point of contact, so it is going to manage to balance. Yeah, yeah, no worries. 
but it'll make it easy to knock down, right? That's that's the fun part. You can also use a mesh collider and make it the same shape, uh, but you'd have to make it kinematic, so you make that mesh collider convex, but we won't get into that too much today. But anyway, so those are some of the windows that you see here in Unity. So let's take a look at how we can set up a VR user. So let's get ourselves started in VR. So here, here are some of the steps we do. Make this project VR capable. We would start by step one, opening up our package manager. So we go to window, package manager, and we're gonna now look for the XR interaction toolkit. You should have point version two available, but if you're having struggle, if you're struggling finding it, you can always search for it over here, just typing in XR, you'll probably find it within the first list there towards the bottom. Again, if uh, to make sure you can see these, we'll want to be in the packages, Unity registry, scroll all the way down and it's going to be your XR interaction toolkit. So that is step one, window, package manager, making sure we're in the Unity registry, scrolling all the way down, XR interaction toolkit, and we just want to install that. You may have to download it the first time, but definitely need to also install it. So we'll give that just a moment. Hope, uh, I am, uh, I hope I didn't get frozen there. Okay, uh, I think I'm back. Uh, hopefully, I didn't, I didn't miss anything. But uh, anyways, after I have uh, after I've imported XR Interaction Toolkit, I'll be prompted with this warning. It needs to use the new input system. So what does that mean? Well, Unity has two kinds of systems. You can use the input manager or the input actions. Sometimes it's nice to have both. But um, here, if you get this warning, you would need to restart Unity. That's correct. So window package manager, XR interaction toolkit, I hit install. It comes up with this uh, whole prompt. It says you need to enable the new input manager. You say, yes, you may come with a uh, little update required options. Say, yep, I made a backup, go ahead. And that will restart your Unity project and make your application have the ability to use VR input, as well as allow you to create a VR rig, which is a combination of the head and hands. Okay, so there I am, I'm back here. Um, I'm going to revisit that package manager. So step one isn't quite done yet, or this is step two actually. Step two is we go back up to window, package manager, and let's go back to our XR interaction toolkit. Now you can see we have a little checkbox here. That means it is it has been installed. Great. And now we can see here there's a samples drop down. Go ahead and expand that samples drop down. And we want to import the starter assets. Now, if you don't have a VR headset, it may be useful for you to do a XR device simulator as well. It's very small. You can get that anyways. But um, we've selected our XR interaction toolkit. And I'm going to import our starter assets. So step two, window, package manager. In our package manager, once again, revisiting XR Interaction Toolkit, this time expanding samples to import the starter assets. Boom, there we go. And you'll see in our assets folder now, in our project window, we have gotten a samples folder with a subfolder called XR Interaction Toolkit with a subfolder called 2.0.0 and starter assets. So this nice little uh, list of folders. So that, that's it. So that is step two. So I can now close this once again, optionally, you can get that device simulator if you want. I'm going to close that window. Okay, great. Now, what we want to do is create uh, our left controller inputs as well as our right controller inputs. So we go ahead and navigate through our assets folder. Here, we can go into samples, XR interaction toolkit, 2.0.0, starter assets, and we are looking for our default left and right controllers. You've got some snap, turn, continuous. We, we don't need to worry about that too much, but that's the idea. So D 
default left controller dot preset. That's the one we want. And so what we're going to do with that is after we've selected it, we go into the inspector window at the top, add to action based controller default. That's what we want to do. So that is step three. Same thing we do with the right controller preset. So default controller preset. If I shrink this down, you can see the names there for sure. So I select that one and also add that to our basic options. Hopefully you don't get a cold. Oh, uh, I, I just got my uh, booster shot yesterday and I'm also allergic to my cat, so it's a, it's, it's rough. <laughs> but uh, add to action based controller default once again. So that is step three. There we go. So now, Here's kind of an optional step that'll just make things easier for you to read. So you go up now to edit step four. This is step four, project settings. And we go to our preset manager, boom, right there. Okay, so once again, that was edit project settings, preset manager. And in here, we can see our nice added default inputs we just worked with. We just got those nice default inputs in there. So I'm just going to call this one right and this one left. So I know for later on purposes. Okay. So there we go. So that's step four. Nice and easy. Now, now comes the time to add our VR user. So what I'll do now is I'll go into my hierarchy window. This is how I add objects into my scene, into my world here. Scene, world, Kind of synonymous in this situation but in my hierarchy window i can either click on the plus symbol here i can click on the word game object at the top or i can right click on some empty gray space here and go down to xr which is a new option available to us and select xr origin action based that's what i want to do okay so we add that into our scene and now we have a vr user in our scene, if you see the XR origin, if I expand the parent-child relationships, it's got a camera offset, the main camera itself, so what the VR user sees, left-hand controller, right-hand controller, which aren't visually represented by anything, but they're there. One thing you'll notice, though, is if I do select, for example, the left-hand controller, there are all of these actions that are filled up. These have values. They wouldn't by default if we didn't follow the previous steps. So make your life a little bit easier this way. Anyways, so we've brought in the XR origin. So that's once again, step five is we're in our hierarchy options, right click in here, XR, XR origin action based. That's what we want to bring in to our scene. And now if you're comfortable with it, you can, you know, double click on it to find it in your scene a couple of times. Uh, you can move it around as you please. So I'm like, I want it to be kind of close to the bowling ball. I want to rotate it so that the camera is facing, well, you can see the blue axis there, but more importantly, you can see the camera. I want it to be facing the pins. So those are a couple things I want to do with my XR origin object. I'm just going to save my scene periodically so I don't lose anything if my computer crashes, right? So that's, that's the idea there. Now, for us to be able to track our controllers, we need one more thing. This is step six, an input action manager. And we can add that to this object here. So now XR origin, I'm just going to add another component. There will be a replay, David, that's correct. Here in my XR origin, I will add a component called the input action manager. So that's how you can add things to an existing game object. I just select that object. In my inspector window, I click add component and I can type in what I need. In this case, input action manager. Boom, there it is. And right now, it has zero, oh, zero action assets. I'm just going to expand that a little bit. I'll hit this plus symbol there at the bottom right. So it has it says none, but it's it gives me the option to put something there. So let's take a look at that again. I added to our XR origin, action input manager. The action assets are zero. So I'm just going to expand this. I'll hit the plus symbol underneath. And this says none. I'm just going to click on the little circle there on the right, and it will find for me this thing, which is this file here. So here, boom, click on the little circle to the right. 
It will look through my assets for this object, but it's placed in to my world now. Great, so that was step seven. Now, step eight is you can optionally add some visuals to your controllers. Now, there's a few different ways to do it. I'm gonna just do it a nice simple way here. So you can see how here my uh, left-hand controller. So once again, what I've done is I've gone to my XR origin, click on the dropdown. I see my camera offset. I click on the dropdown so I can see these game objects here. My left controller, if I double click on it a couple of times, it'll take me right to it. But I, I can see there's nothing there. There's no visual representation. Now, if you look in the inspector window, Kai, great question. So the input manager is actually there for allowing our hands to be tracked. The movement of our hands are trackable because of that input action manager, as well as you know, squeezing the grip, pressing the buttons. So we need all of those things to make it work. Good question. So our left-hand controller, for example, has this XR controller action base. If you want it, you have a hand model in your project somewhere. You can drag and drop that into this model prefab parent whatnot. So you can definitely do that. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to right-click on it. And I'm going to go ahead, 3D object cube. So it's a pretty big cube, as you can see. So what I'll do is with this cube, I'm just going to check its scale, 0 0.1 in the X, 0 0.1 in the Y, and 0 0.2 in the Z, so I get a nice little cube representing my hands. That's all that's that's happening there. So once again, to add a visual, just went on down through my XR origin, got my left-hand controller. I can right-click on it while it's selected, go down to 3D object cube, and boom, it creates a cube as a child. So if my left-hand controller moves, the cube will move with it, right? That's the parent-child uh, situation once again. And it's rather big. It's one meter, which is just over a yard or three and a half feet, you know, in all directions. It's a really big hand. So I'm just going to take this cube, set its scale values through the transform component, 0 0.1 in the X, 0 0.1 in the Y, and 0 0.2 in the Z. So kind of like a open palm. And I'll just copy that. So I can do Command C or Control C and paste that or right click and paste as a child of the right hand controller. So we got these nice little cubes going. All right, so that is a visual for our hand. Now, it's not quite ready yet. We need to do one more thing, and that is to bring in our XR plugin management to allow us to use things like VR controllers. So last step. Step nine, we go to edit, project settings. At the bottom, there is XR plugin management. We wanna install that. So once again, edit, project settings, XR plugin management, click on install XR plugin management, brings us in, brings in the development kits that we need to be able to use VR in a particular platform. Okay, so with that installed, boom, you'll see these things here. So I have the PC icon here, iOS icon, if you were starting to develop for uh, you know, Apple's AR devices. I've got WebGL, if you were trying to make some web VR experience perhaps. Got the Android option here as well to do augmented reality with an Android phone or tablet or the Oculus Quest, if you wanna develop for the Meta Quest or whatever they're calling it now. But I'll go ahead with PC for now. If you have the Oculus Quest, you're building onto it, then you would select Android and enable Oculus there. If you just wanna run this on your desktop, which I will be doing with the Oculus Link, I would go to the PC version and enable it there. Let's just go give that a moment to uh, complete. Go to the PC version and I enable Oculus there. Boom, there we go. So now this project is capable with desktop VR as well as Oculus Quest. So now we are ready to walk around in VR. We can see things and do all that good stuff. So now I'm just gonna split my game window over here so we can see both things at the at the same time. What, what the developer sees on the left, what the 
user sees on the right. If I hit play, you can see I can look around with my head. And if I use my controller, you can see I've got this nice little laser pointer telling me what I can grab and some visual for my controller. Here we go. So I've got something going to represent myself and give me presence and all that good stuff. But I also want to be able to grab something. So now this is beyond setting up VR. This is creating interactions. Now I'm just going to take a brief moment here. Take a look in the chat here. So uh, let's take a look at some of the questions. Would we use Unity for non-game development, productivity tools, virtual desktops? 100% Mel, you can use it for pretty much everything. Will we get assets, etc. from the, yes, you will. Which mobile GFX card is good enough for Oculus Link? I think the minimum is NVIDIA GTX, uh, as well as NVIDIA GTX 1060. So 970, 1060, those are the minimum requirements, but you can definitely go a lot higher than that. How to change hand controllers from left-handed? Would they be different? Interesting question. So you would set up both. So there is, you know, I just put up a cube, but uh, if you had a hand model and you only had one hand model, that's a right hand, you could always make the scale in the X negative and boom, it turns into a right hand. So that's a little technique for anyone. That's if that's what you're asking. Otherwise, you won't do anything different. They're both both hands have the same functionality. They're able to grab things essentially, but there's nothing to grab. Although it looks like, hey, there's something right here, the bowling ball. I should be able to grab it, but uh, well, it's not set up. So what we need to do is let's select this bowling ball and make it grabbable. How do we do that? Well, it's already got a visual, so that's great. Mesh filter, mesh render, those define the visual aspect of an object. But let's add a sphere collider. So if you type in the word collider, those are you know, your physics elements for collision detection, how much physical space it's taking up. You can even do a box collider on this sphere if you wanted. But let's add a sphere collider. So I scroll down here, I can see the sphere collider. And Unity will generally do a pretty good job at uh, trying to find the appropriate size for that. But you know, it doesn't have to be the same. It could even be offset, right? The, the physical space that it's taking up being different than the visual space, that's totally doable as well. Keep those in mind that those aren't operating on the same uh, card there, or the same processor necessarily. But anyways, I've got nice looking sphere collider going. Okay, so that's one thing. I've got something to detect collisions, but there's no physics on this object. If I hit it, I go right through it, or I can't go right through it, but it won't move. So I need to add a rigid body. So this is the physics component that allows me to push it around or it, for it to have collisions and roll around, those kinds of things. There is my rigid body and I'll let it use gravity. That makes sense. Okay. So, so far we've added a sphere collider or some kind of collider as well as a rigid body. So those are two out of three requirements for you to be able to pick something up. Third requirement is that you give something the XR grab interactable component. This script needs to be attached to this object such that you can pick it up with your controllers, whether it's a ray interactor or direct interactor. Those are the options you have there, but uh, that's the idea. So three requirements for making something you can pick up. It needs a collider to be able to check that it's there physically. Rigid body for forces to be applied so that you can alter this component's uh, properties to pick it up and the grab interactable to handle a lot of those calculations, even throwing the object. Okay, so that's one thing that's uh, settled. Let's take a look at how that behaves in Unity. I'm just gonna go ahead and hit play, see what happens. So I've got my hand just like before. Now I can point at that, and you can see what's going on. See, it turns white. Boom, there we go. Oh, sorry with that. And then I'll try and roll it. Oh. But uh, it's not rolling really fast. It's not slipping or sliding. It's probably not going to make it. And if it does make it all the way over there, it'll probably just not even knock them down because how slow it is moving, right? So that's that's too much. 
It's also colliding with my head, which is a little interesting. I think you can push it around now. But that, that's okay. All right. But let's tackle this next issue. If I try to use it as a bowling ball, bowling balls are quite slippery. So I can go like this. Whoa. Yeah, I'm trying to throw it, but it's going real slow. So let's see how we can address that issue next. What element is necessary to add in XR origin? So for your XR origin, you need to add the action, input action manager. And then when you have your action assets, just make sure that you, you can set that to one or hit the plus symbol there. And just click on the little circle there that appears you know, to the right there. And just in a, just add this one. Put this one in there. That's You should only have that one option anyways. Hopefully that helps you there. Okay, so what do we do now? How do I make this slip and slide? Well, Unity has this set of materials. Materials allow you to color an object differently. So for example, you're welcome, Simon. If I was to create a material, this is just the visual side. So materials are assets. So if I create a material, I call it blue and select the blue and then maybe I change the color to blue. That's great, and I can apply that to something. And that's the visual material, so that's something I can do. But there's also things called physics materials. So I'll go back and create a new folder for that. You don't have to go so far, but physics materials is folder name here. And what I'll do is I'll right-click create, go up to uh, or go down to physics material. So regular materials some of you may already be familiar with those are the visual side physics material handle collisions so i'll add that in and i'll call this one slippery like so so i've created a physics material now if i select this ball you'll see that under its collider there is a material option so like i was saying this one uses a physics material so what is a physics material let's select this now, with the physics material selected, you can see that I have a few properties, very few. Dynamic friction. So this is how much resistance to movement it has while it's moving. Static friction, the resistance to start moving. Bounciness, well, it's defaulting most things to zero, but bounciness is pretty uh, self-explanatory. But we have friction combine and bounce combine. So what are, what are those properties really doing? I'm just going to quickly show that here put that back and let's take a look at a replica of this okay so with these properties what do we what are we doing so dynamic friction as i explained it's resistance to movement while it's moving static resistance to movement while it's static while it's not moving so resistance to start movement bounciness is bounciness what are these combines for? Well, whenever you're having a physics interaction, two colliders are interacting with each other. And those two colliders together determine how objects behave. So let's say, for example, you had, you know, sandpaper, this, this sandpaper kind of material, and then you had an ice cube, right? So you have this nice little ice cube here. I'm going to do that in blue. And when it runs across the sandpaper, how should it behave versus how this should behave? So when it comes to the ice cube, we would have zero in the dynamic and static friction. But when it comes to the sandpaper, we would probably put this to like 100, right? So now those two objects have different, totally different physics materials. So let's dissect that just a little bit more. Okay. so. If these are both moving in some way, these are both rigid bodies, we'd want to know the different physics material on them. So the slippery one is applied to this. It has zero friction. The, let's call it sandpaper physics material is applied to this. Okay. Now, if the cube interacts with the sandpaper and the material on the cube says average for the friction combine, then the cube will behave as if its friction values were 50 takes the average. If you did the other options include 
multiply, minimum, multiply, and maximum. So what if it was to say minimum, the ice cube's behavior would be as if it has zero friction. So it would be completely slippery, no friction at all. So choosing the physics materials combine determines how this is going to behave. So you have average, which would mean that it behaves with 50, minimum being zero, maximum being 100, and multiply is just if you multiply these two numbers together, which is just zero again, which makes it behave the same. Same idea with bouncing as combine, same, same goal. So my slippery physics material, I'm going to lower its dynamic friction to zero, static friction to zero, friction combine will be minimum, so it'll always be zero. So that's what's happened there. So now if I hit play, I could grab this bowling ball and uh, I actually didn't apply this physics material, I don't think. So let me make sure that's done. So I have my bowling ball selected. There's my sphere collider. I'm going to drag and drop my slippery physics material into the sphere collider's material section. Boom. There we go. Now let's try that out. All right. So last time it was super slow. Let's see what happens now. Oh, I, uh, I gave it too much spin. Oh, okay. I'm going to try and get some room here. There we go. Now that's better. Not saying that it's great, but it is better. <laughs> and so you can alter things along the way for how slippery it should be and not. Maybe zero is too much, but that's up to you to uh, mess around with. Okay, so I think we have enough time to do a little bit more, uh, but that should give you the essentials for getting started making VR experiences. How can you add spin to the ball, which can manipulate the spin? Well, the way you let go of the object, so if I'm moving the object with my hand and you know, towards the end of it, I spin my hand while I let it go, the object will spin. However, if you want to add resistance to spin, the rigid body has components like angular drag. So if you increase this, then it won't spin that much. If you decrease this, zero, for example, it'll spin a lot. That's the idea. The name triple X does not exist in the current context. What, uh, what name? That's very strange. You can take a look at that, Simon, in a bit. But uh, that's, that's the idea. So, thanks so much. Ah, you're welcome. A lot of names. Okay. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see what we can do with that, Simon. All right. But um, we'll come back. Okay. So, anyways, there is our simplified bowling experience. Let's we'll throw our bowling ball down the lane. And so you can add so much more to this, of course, with a full-fledged bowling experience. You would have a scoreboard. You can knock down the pins and check if you got a strike or what's your score. And then based on what how you did, the pins reset, the ball comes back here, that kind of thing. Uh, so I'll show just a little bit towards that direction just so you can see kind of how some of those things happen. So we've been dealing with colliders. We haven't coded anything yet. The one thing I will do is I'll go to the end of my lane. Now we'll just add a cube there. Got this cube. And I'm just going to move it to the end of my lane here, like so. And I'm just going to move it behind the pins, like so. Move it down, like so. Why am I doing this? Well, I'm positioning this cube in such a way that when I miss, I get a gutter ball or when my or when my uh, bowling ball you know, hits the pins and falls back behind, right? So when that happens, I'm going to make an event happen. I'm going to make it such that, okay, reset the ball. Bring it back to the beginning. That's the idea. There's my box. Now, this box is simply going to be a trigger zone, right? It's not going to I'm going to do anything else. Now, you notice I'm manipulating the object. Well, when I have an object selected, I can either manually change the transforms or I can use some of these tools up here. The move tool to click and drag it around. The rotate tool to rotate it along a particular axis. The scale tool to scale it along a particular axis as well. 
In terms of navigating Unity, you have the right mouse button to look around. You have the middle mouse wheel to scroll in and out, or the middle mouse button to pan. If you, uh, if you don't have a middle mouse, uh, you can also hit the Q key or click on the hand tool at the top left to look around as well. Then you want to switch back to the move tool if you want to select something. Uh, there's also other ways. So for example, if you hold the Alt key, you'll see this little eye icon, and then you can right click to zoom in and out. You can left click to pan around. You press F to focus in on an object when you have one selected. Uh, if you hold down the right mouse button, you can also use WASD, Q and E to fly around. So a lot of these navigation methods are going to be a little tricky to get used to, but uh, it'll be worthwhile. Anyways, I positioned this cube at the end behind my bowling pins. And what I'm going to do with it is just say, okay, well, I don't need to see this. So I'm going to right click on the mesh filter and remove that component, right click on the mesh renderer and remove that component. All I need is this box collider. Now, there's this interesting function called on trigger enter. I did some updates. Show me how to view the bowling alley in the scene window. Oh, uh, once again, you go to assets, models, bowling assets. There's a scene file. You double click on that. And it will load this in. Make sure you have a scene tab active so you can see it. Anyways, with my cube selected here, I want to make this collider a trigger. Why am I doing that? Well, in our code, we can react to trigger events. So we can say, you know, when that trigger zone is entered, do something. Okay, what are we going to do? So this is the little bit of coding that we've provided, uh, just to introduce you a little bit to it. So something like this. So I'll go to my scripts folder. I'll right-click and create a new C-sharp script, like so. And I'll call it reset all. Right, so reset ball. That's the name of my class or C sharp script. Now the way coding works in Unity is that you would, you know, create some scripts and you would select an object and apply that code to them like this, right? So that something becomes active. But anyways, I don't need the reset ball script to be on the bowling ball. I need it on that cube because what's going to happen in this script? I'm using Visual Studio here. Hopefully you all have the autofill option going as well. Autocomplete or IntelliSense, I mean. Some ways to get to fixing that, but there's a lot of possible reasons why it's not working. But anyways, here's my script. Uh, this is called a code stub. Here we have what are called using directives. This is just adding functionality to our code. This is public, so we can see this script from other scripts. Class reset ball, you can think of this like, okay, this is the script called reset ball. Colon mono behavior, this is called inheritance. This inheritance allows us to use certain functions like start and update. So these functions, these things here, void start, these execute, they do things at certain times of your experience, at certain point in your experience. The update function just keeps running over and over again. So you could say things like, if I press the W key, move forward. And the update function would keep checking every frame if you are pressing the W key. That's the idea with some of these functions. But uh, we don't need any of those. If they're empty, you should get rid of them because they're still taking up processing power regardless of whether or not they have content. Okay, reset ball script. I'm just gonna say, I need a public uh, game object reference. And this is gonna be called my prefab ball. Now a prefab is considered a prefabricated asset. It's like a file that you have in your project. But this particular kind of file is of type game object. This allows me to reference a bowling ball I'll save in my project window so I can just spawn them into my scene as much as I want. That's the idea. Okay, so that's what I need there. Now, I need another variable, but this time it's a transform because transform store position values. And this is going to be simply the ball spawn. So this is going to be storing the location of where my bowling ball is brought into the world. So that's the purpose of those. And this is just another variable called uh, current ball. Something like that is the idea. 
Okay, so with that information, what I would do is I would create a void on trigger enter function. Now we're doing some really quick coding here, high level stuff. This is designed for some of the more advanced people to just see and get the idea. But uh, throughout the courses, we do dive deeper into this and start at a more beginning, uh, beginner friendly level. But uh, to get a rough idea, it's like, okay, I create some variables. So these are like buckets for information so they can reference things like, okay, this is gonna reference a file that is a game object. This is a transform. So it's meant to reference a transform, which could be in our scenes for position rotation values. This game object could be current ball. This is just, you know, we're gonna reference it so that we can destroy it or whatnot. We may not even need that actually. I think I can simplify this for you all. Anyways, so what we're spawning in, where we're spawning it, that's what that's for. On trigger enter is gonna happen when the bowling ball enters our uh, our box there. It will destroy that one and spawn a new one. Now, this is not the proper way to do it, but hopefully this gives you a rough idea of what's going on. So we say on trigger enter, something touches the box. We say, okay, um, destroy the other dot game object. We destroy what entered the box. So the bowling ball gets destroyed. And then we instantiate a new bowling ball at the ball spawn dot position. And then you can just say ball spawn dot rotation. And that, that would be it. So when a trigger is entered, you destroy that object that entered the trigger zone, and then you instantiate, create an instance of, spawn in the ball prefab, that's our file there, at this position with this rotation. That's the idea on trigger enter. Uh, now, if a pin falls in, it'll do the same thing. So that's a little thing you'll want to create a condition for, but we'll, uh, we'll avoid getting too deep into the weeds with this. That, that's the idea. That's how you would start kind of coding this thing. But this gets into kind of the later portion of the course. Uh, so you'd start with some more simpler stuff initially. That, that's the goal. So this script I would do, what I would do is put that on the cube in the end there. So that cube I, I created, that's right over here. I will just take this reset ball script, attach it to this cube. You can see it's looking for a prefab and the ball spawn. Now, fortunately, the ball spawn is located where the ball spawn point is. So I've got for you all a ball spawn object. So that's just going to be where the balls spawn. So it's just an empty game object. It has nothing on it beside the transform. So we say, okay, um, this cube, that empty cube, that's gonna pick up the bowling ball. It's going to reference that ball spawn. So I can just drag and drop it into that ball spawn spot. So it knows where this is now. And this bowling ball, well, I want this to be the thing that I spawn over and over again. So this is called a prefab. And generally you create a folder for all of your prefabs. This is going beyond the uh, version that you have there. But now what you can do is I have this new folder. I can drag and drop a game object from my hierarchy window into my project window and boom, I just created a file of it. So now I can just bring any as many of those in to the scene as I want. So that's what I'll do. I'll select that cube once again. And the prefab ball that it's going to spawn is this ball that I've created a prefab out of. So that, that's a short form of what a prefab is. In the course, we dive deeper into prefabs, prefab variants, nested prefabs, and stuff of that nature. Um, but let's, uh, let's just test this out and see what happens. Yep, I hit my table. One sec. Okay, well, I missed, but it's going to the end, and when it falls, you should see something spawn right there. There you go. So it fell into the back, on trigger enter occurred, it got destroyed back there, and a new one got spawned over here. It's, uh, it's a bit easier to do than having it just reposition that ball or something. <laughs> but that, that's the idea. Well, thank you everyone for uh, 
for sticking around for all of that. We'll do some Q&A afterwards. Hey, Raphael. Thanks for coming, man. That's right on. Raphael is one of our uh, old students here. So Raphael actually went through the Unity Dev course where we did this did this uh, bowling application using a PC. So I thought I'd invite him over to see it done in VR. Okay, everyone. If you have any more questions, please stick around for the uh, for the section after uh, Brendan here takes over, and we'll, we'll do this. Can I do this project using Unreal Engine, or is this or is Unity easier to learn? Unity is much easier to learn for sure. Um, it has there's a bigger community, so that's why there's better documentation. There's more tutorials out there, so Unity is definitely easier to learn because of that. Um, that being said, Unity has a far more vested interest in VR AR. So the tools there are a little bit better as well. But anyways, I, I, I digress. Take it over, Brendan. Sounds good. <clears throat> um, Ozzy, thank you so much uh, for, for leading the charge there and, uh, and showing us how to create a bowling experience in VR. Let me get my, uh, my screen working here. Um, was super upset to see that you didn't get any turkeys and uh and those are those are the last two attempts i mean gutter balls are never uh never a good thing but uh nonetheless i think uh i think our audience is fired up about what you showed them today um i do want to uh to just share a little bit more information before we get into the q a um before i jump ahead of myself here um before we get into that information, I want to share another poll. Uh, so I'd really appreciate if everyone could jump over to the polls tab. I'm going to publish another one, uh, and it's on a scale of zero to ten. How likely are you to recommend this workshop, you know, to a friend or colleague or you know any other interested party? Um, doing this just kind of helps us understand, you know, what content is is valuable, what content is interesting for everybody, uh, and make sure that we are, uh, you know, putting out great content that uh, that people are very curious about. Uh, so I published that. Check the polls tabs uh, again. Very much appreciated. Uh, anyone who uh, who casts their vote. Um, now I want to shed more light on the courses and programs, starting with our self-directed AR short course. Uh, if you're looking to get started in AR and complete your first AR project, uh, check out our six-part AR video course. It is self-directed, uh, and it, it's meant to basically uh, allow you to build your first kind of small project uh, for AR devices. Uh, now, for anyone wanting to expand their XR horizons, CircuitStream has a number of course offerings meant to equip students and professionals with the skills to either pursue their own immersive projects or develop the necessary skills to pursue a career in the XR industry. Uh, so our XR Development with Unity course is a live instructor-led curriculum with plenty of avenues for enduring support for both students as well as alumni. Uh, it's a project and portfolio-driven learning experience supplemented with opportunities to acquire an XR industry-specific certification through CircuitStream. The course is priced at 3950 US, and upcoming cohorts are launching on May 17th. Uh, for anybody who is maybe affiliated with any of our university partners, we also have upcoming cohorts launching on March 8th uh, for anyone associated with the University of British Columbia Extended Learning. Uh, March 8th, again, for anyone associated with University of Toronto School of Continuing Studies. Uh, and then that same date, May 17th, uh, for anyone in, uh, involved with the University of San Diego Professional and Continuing Education. Uh, and May 17th, again, for anyone associated with the University of California, Riverside. Um, so each of our beginner-friendly XR courses is structured very similarly. Um, so with our interaction design and prototyping course, you can expect the same project-driven live instructor-led format, complete with its own specific certification path for artists and designers. Uh, again, the course is, uh, is structured very similarly, um, five hours per week of live instruction with three hours, uh, or sorry, three hours a week of live instruction with five uh, hours of open office hours that you can also attend. Um, the course is also priced at 3950 US, and the next cohort uh, directly through CircuitStream will be launching April 20th um, for our you know, university affiliates and partners. Um, it's going to be the same launch date, so April 20th for the University of British Columbia Extended Learning, April 20th for U of T School of Continuing Studies, April 20th for the University of San Diego Professional and Continuing Education, and April 20th for the University of California Riverside. Um, one more quick note about our beginner-friendly 10-week courses is we have the standalone option, but we also 
uh, are currently offering a plus package, which includes one of our either one of our XR Dev or XR Interaction Design courses, uh, but also our C Sharp Scripting Fundamentals course and 10 hours of dedicated one-on-one -on -one time with an instructor. Uh, which we recommend using for project support or further mentorship on XR concepts. Now, lastly, our 24-week uh, Unity Developer Bootcamp. Uh, this is our career course. It will be launching on April 11th uh, and will prepare you for your career in 3D development. Uh, so you're going to learn all about C-sharp coding logic uh, and scripting. You're going to be able to build 10 plus projects, including one that's your very own idea that you want to pursue. Uh, there's one-on-one -on -one career services throughout, uh, as well as after the course concludes. Uh, you'll receive an industry-recognized certification, both from CircuitStream as well as Unity. Uh, and currently, there are over $100,000 in scholarships available. So if you are curious about launching your career using Unity, um, definitely a great place to start. Uh, tuition for the Unity Developer Bootcamp is normally 14,995 US, uh, but currently we have scholarships available for anyone who successfully completes the application process, which includes a Unity aptitude test. Successfully applied, this will bring the course tuition to just under 8,000 US. Uh, and then just a little note, we had, we had uh, 15 seats available. Um, since then we've had eight successful applicants, uh, so that, it, that means there are seven remaining. Uh, now, we also have flexibility around tuition and payment for any of our flagship courses. Uh, so for either the XR Dev uh, design courses or the Unity Developer Bootcamp, uh, we have plans that allow you to kind of extend that and, and manage that cost over a three to 12 month period for international students. Uh, and that would be through an internal plan uh, or up to five years uh, for any of our US students through our financing partner called Climb. Uh, so anyone, you know, any eligible applicants or anyone who, you know, has an eligible co-borrower uh, basically can apply for any of these, um, these plans. Uh, so regarding certifications, I wanted to give everyone uh, an idea of the certifications you can attain through our flagship courses. So here's just a quick snapshot of the certification path offered through each of our flagship courses. So the Unity Developer Bootcamp. Uh, would result in a Unity Developer Certification through CircuitStream, as well as a Certified Associate Programmer Certification through Unity directly. Uh, for the XR Development with Unity course, the XR Developer with Unity Certification uh, would be achieved at the end of the curriculum. And for the XR Interaction Design and Prototyping course, the XR Designer Certification would be achieved at the end of the uh, course. Now, personally, uh, my favorite part about the education we provide has to be our uh, our circuit stream community. So it's a great place to network, collaborate, or or even participate in events like game jams. It's also where the enduring support for students and alumni resides. Uh, we have open office hours five times a week uh, with our instructors that are you know available to existing students and alumni. And again, you can use that as kind of you know project support troubleshooting or to kind of you know, probe them about any uh, additional education that you may be pursuing. Um, massive shout out also to Arky, who is our student experience coordinator. She is constantly mixing things up in there, regularly with coffee hours, showcases, and events like Demo Day, where our students are invited to share their personal projects and stories. Uh, so if you're looking to get a closer look at any of our course syllabi, you can download them from uh, our site, uh, circuitstream.com, or any of our affiliate uh, university websites as well. Uh, if you are you know, curious and if you're looking for specific questions to be answered, contact anyone on our admissions teams. Uh, that would include Roham, Leon, uh, Leanne, sorry, Tyler, Shoshana, Marvell, and myself. Uh, we'd be happy to discuss your learning goals uh, and just shed any additional light that you may be looking for. Uh, when it comes to circuit stream. Uh, lastly, just wanted to say thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, it was a great uh, it was a great lesson today, great workshop. Um, and we have we do have a few questions, so I definitely want to bring Ozzy back onto the stage uh, when he has a moment. So we'll be able to address uh, any remaining questions that are there. And it looks like I think you had answered uh, a bunch during the workshop, which was super helpful. Um, 
want to just check out and make sure that we don't have any additional questions here that we uh, did not answer. Um, I answered the ones up till uh, how to change hand controllers for left-handed and then from up from there, I didn't answer those. So the top two there. Okay. So just the, just the top two we're looking to. Yeah. Are you doing the courses? I imagine. I imagine okay. Auto school. Okay. okay. Well, yeah. Are you, uh, so what courses are you uh, instructing? Okay. Um, so I am instructing the XR dev course. I'll be teaching the course at the U of C, the university of California or Caltech. I can't remember <laughs> which one, but, uh, as well as part of the boot camp. So there'll be several instructors teaching the boot camp, but that's what I'll be doing. And then, uh, later on we'll have the unity dev course, uh, not XR related per se, just a development course that I'll also be teaching. Uh, don't teach the design course, but I may be a guest star at some point. That's, uh, <laughs> okay, that's, that's me though. Awesome. Awesome. So university of California Riverside, I think that's the one you were. Oh, you were thank you. Yes, yeah. That's the one I appreciate. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. And, um, oh, let me see here. I can't uh, seem to do the auto thing there, but, uh, oh, there we go. So I imagining auto scrolling would be quite complicated. Would that be covered in any part of the course? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, we don't actually cover this workshop in VR during any of the courses. The course material is a lot more uh, in depth and covers different uh, concepts. Uh, VR bowling one is nice, fun, uh, kind of simple thing, but uh, unfortunately this isn't part of one of the projects. However, during the courses, if you do one-on-one -on -one time or you attend office hours, you can definitely choose to tackle on more complex portions of this particular workshop. So definitely uh, an option for you. And with that said, though, as a quick reminder, you can, if you get into one of the courses, you can optionally get some one-on-ones, but you can also attend office hours. And my office hours are Mondays at 1 p.m. Pacific time every week. So love to see some of you all there and i'll answer whatever questions uh i can yeah beautiful i think we have one more um from malik so uh here i'll post it up here okay would we use unity for non-game development i.e productivity tools virtual desktop etc that's a great oh, question yeah. actually about 80 percent of the work i do is non-game related so 100 percent, you can do that there's a lot of training and education ones as well. So that's definitely a big part of uh, the big benefit of XR in modern day. But yeah, that's the idea. Yeah, uh, I think I think there's a lot of uh, like a lot of, you know, indie devs that that just focus on the tool for like game development. So that's what we hear about. But uh, yeah. but definitely there are, are so many, you know, business use cases for it. Um, and that's that's, you know, something that we, we like to help our students explore as well. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, I love working on games. Don't get me wrong. That's my favorite thing to work on, but yeah, it's not the majority of what we do. We end up doing. I've got, I've got one last question for you as, as long as, uh, as long as nobody else here, how's it here, Benny? You made my day. Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, Kai, thank you so much. Thank you, Kai. Uh, awesome. And, uh, my question for you is how is your game coming along? I've been, uh, you know, wanting to play it. I've been itching to, uh, to try it out again. Okay, this is a good question. He's talking about <laughs> this game called Rifts of Eudoria. Yes. I can, uh, let, me, let me see if I can pull that up for everyone. Now, for me, it's been tough because I've been super busy, especially starting uh, the the Metaverse project with um, with FOMA. So here's what I'll I'll share this link with everyone who wants to check this out. Um, it'll take some time to come out. Uh, once I get some more spare time, I'll work on it some more. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's a super fun game to work on. Did telekinesis, spawning weapons, throwing those around, a lot of different spells and stuff. So, awesome. So it's a good time. It's super fun in there. But uh, it'll take some time to build, but especially since the project idea is quite large in terms of making an RPG. I might scale it down to be a kind of an arena fighter, but we'll we'll see how it goes. <laughs> Good stuff. Yeah, I mean, maybe starts out as an arena fighter, and then you can expand the universe there. That's yeah, that's that's good. Uh, if I put it out there, people get interested in it, and then that'll definitely encourage me to um, upgrade it to an RPG or add multiplayer functionality. We'll see. <laughs> 
All right. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for joining us, Ozzy. That was brilliant. Thank you uh, so much for, for leading the charge with the workshop. Uh, and uh, until next time, um, everybody, enjoy the rest of your day. I, uh, I believe Simon had a quick uh, technical difficulty. Oh. I can see if I can uh, see it. Raphael, the recording will actually be the same link that you see now. So if you just stick around after we finish recording, it'll actually play the recording for you after we finish the live session. Uh, at least that's what I remember. Alrighty. And sorry, you said there was a, a tech, uh, technical question as well? Yeah. Um, Simon, you said that there's you found some errors. And is that error from the downloaded version that uh, you got from the GitHub? Is that correct? I believe we'll send you an email with the record. Yeah, I send. I said the assets in GitHub. Okay, so you got them from GitHub, and yet you're experiencing an error. Could you copy and paste one of those errors? Actually, um, how do we get in contact with Simon after this? Clone the repo. Yeah, but uh, I was just looking for a copy of what the error says exactly. It's, Sounds like, uh, what was your description here? It was CS0103. The name does not exist in its current context. Did you alter any of the code? If anything, for now, you could remove the code and uh, write it again from what we had in uh, the recording. I think that'll be the best way to do it because we do run out of time. So quick solution for now delete whatever script file that is there because there's not supposed to be much code from the GitHub anyways. And then just uh, copy it again from the recording. That'll be your guaranteed solution, I think. That's script file anyways. But uh, all right, I'm going to try to Try that solution. Yes, I mean, that sounds good. Uh, otherwise, feel free to reach out here. Yeah, otherwise, reach out to me there, and then we'll, we'll see. All right. Thank you, everyone. You know, get, get those polls with the ratings and feedback. <laughs> that would be appreciated. Yeah, anyone who, uh, anyone who hasn't, uh, hit that poll yet much appreciated your feedback is always uh is always much appreciated and uh and yeah we'll look forward to seeing uh seeing you all out at the next next workshop uh but goodbye for now <laughs>